Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Fine? I'm very glad you're here this afternoon because it's sunny outside after two pouring days in Milano. So very happy to see a full room. You really are willing to learn? Get updated. Thank you for being here. Well, th initially, I would like to thank Nestle for inviting me to be here with you this afternoon and sharing with you a little bit of my impression regarding the topic. These are my disclosures. I think the biggest one is that I truly believe in nutrition therapy, in ethics, in safety and quality. And my talk will evolve through this. So I'm going to cover the balance of nutrients, how to calculate or estimate energy requirements based on carbohydrates, lipids and proteins. I'm not going to go into details. In, the, in these three uh, macronutrients, then briefly cover what optimal uh, health outcomes are, the challenges, and we definitely have lots of challenges in clinical practice and, of course, in research also, and my conclusions. So let me go back in time. When Plato and Aristotle started discussing the importance of air, fire, water, and earth, what were they trying to show the world, the balance, exactly the topic of our symposium. And we know from a long time ago, the Minnesota experiment, that being in a negative balance, although you are healthy, you end up losing body composition. You lose weight. But not only that, you also are at higher risk of adverse events. And these men, previously healthy, were at higher risk of infections, uh, pulmonary infections, and other situations. And Professor Anselke has registered this very, very well. Let's go back farther in time. Lavoisier. He was probably the first one studying calorimetry in animals. Uh, and then, in the United States, the father of the American science of nutrition, Wilbur Atwaters developed the first direct calorimeter. And as you can see here, exactly with the attempt of measuring how much energy do we need, but not only that, how much energy nutrients provided. So one gram of proteins, four calories, all to these uh, researcher. But we all know the Harris Benedict formula. Who uses the Harris Benedict formula in this room? Raise your hand. So, still used nowadays. Now, do you know how it was developed by Harris and Benedict? By studying 136 men and 103 women and also children, 94. And they f did this study from 1909 to 19. 17, so over 100 years ago, and we still use their formula. But I have to say to you that unfortunately, what we still use nowadays was built up based on not an adequately scientific methods. Then the World Health Organization, aware of the importance, publishes this in 2001, regarding human energy requirements. And it's their statement saying that this is important because energy requirements are, reg uh, are related to the attainment and maintenance of optimal health, physiological function, and well-being. So we all know we need energy requirements. Let's go to the guidelines. If we talk, and I'm mentioning the Aspen guidelines, because we are at Aspen, uh, hospital diet should offer about 30 kilocalories per kilo per day, geriatrics, 30, uh, polymor polymorbid medical patients, 27. Um, there's always a similarity between 25, 30, and as we move to cancer patients, the same, 25 to 30. Intensive care patients, 20 to 25. Now, based on what? Do you know? Do you guys know? Calorimetry. But we'll discuss this further. 
Now let's go to protein requirements. And again, Lavoisier. Although this guy was important, it didn't save him from the guillotine. So being a researcher doesn't mean you have your life guaranteed. Sometimes you can get into trouble. But uh, he was asked by the Ministry of Navy uh, to calculate how much broth was needed to feed uh, not only in hospital individuals, patients, but also prisoners. Then in Germany, Carl von Hoyt decided, decided that a person with a body weight of 70 with a mother work would need 180 grams of protein. This would be the lowest limit, although his studies had indicated only 40, 52, <coughs> enough for good health. So we came up with a double. Based on what? We don't know. Back to America, Atwater, who had spent some time in, German with, in Germany with Carl Voigt, a very big protein enthusiast, said that Americans worked more and ate better. Not really nowadays. And because of that, they would need 110 grams of protein, especially working men. But then, as always, there is controversy, OK? So we have this Danish researcher and an American one <coughs> saying less is more. 30 grams is enough. And the proof of concept is given here. They even show a picture of a guy that had been on a 30 gram protein diet, muscles. I don't know how much true that was, but we know that giving too much might not be the real world. And we have the protein fiasco in Africa. And we can talk more about that later because I don't have much time, but this is just to raise your awareness to something that we are today discussing, and it has been discussed throughout the times. The World Health Organization, then the technical committee involving the League of Nations, comes up based on data, not really much data, hypothesis with some evidence. I don't know which evidence. But they say one gram of protein per kilo per day is uh, indicated. And more recently, 2007, uh, they say that the average adult needs 0.66 or 105 grams of nitrogen, but if you give up to 0.8, that will cover 97.5% of the healthy adult population. What about our patients? Well, Aspen says that for the elderly, at least one gram of protein per kilo per day. And now I take you to a more recent paper where the authors discussed, this was a symposium based on protein nutrition and aging, where the, author, the authors discuss is just only grams per kilo or do we have to consider other things? And let me guide you through this figure. According to them, if you take protein A or protein B, if you are a healthy adult, these three groups, or if you go farther up, uh, and this line here, oops, I'm sorry, this line here represents the minimum to reach basic amino acids such as leucine, lysine, and so on. So if you take this protein A, and I'm not going to name it, you'll have to read the article, uh, you reach the minimum. If you take this one, the same amount, you don't reach lysine. So in order to increase or to receive more lysine, you'll have to increase the whole amount of that nutrient, which means that you might overload your liver and your kidney. So it's not only the quantity, but also the quality. And if we move on to the older healthy adult or to others, the sick ones, you will see that either both protein A, 0.8 or 0.8 for the sick ones, unlikely will reach all the essential amino acids to be able to have a good synthesis of um, muscle synthesis. 
So, in summary, Aspen guidelines, protein requirements, healthy adults, 0.81, hospitalized patients, 1.2, older adults, 1.2 to 1.5, polymorbid, more than one, cancer, more than one, but uh, if you were yesterday at Carla Prado's presentation where she's studying uh, how many uh, grams per kilo cancer patients need, you probably uh, heard her say two grams. And critical ill patients, up to two grams. Now, my question to you, Newton or Einstein? Because when Einstein uh, published his ideas, which by the way, till now I do not understand anything about them, uh, the theory of relativity, um, he was totally against what Newton had said. Now, was Newton wrong or vice versa? Or maybe are we talking of different things, different times, different methods? So, having said so, how do we impact optimal health outcomes? Let's start by knowing what optimal health outcomes are. Optimal, best, ideal. But how can I dis discuss this, discuss what this outcome is, uh, this is to say an event that occurs as a result of an intervention, if my interventions are wide, from 20 to 30 kilograms, kilocals per, per kilo, from one point to two, 100% different. So how can I assess outcomes if I have different basic interventions? Um, and these outcomes may be measured clinically, like physical examination, laboratory testing, imaging, or even self-reported or observed, which again is a wide range of um, options. According to the University of Waterloo in Canada, you need to involve three key elements to assess outcomes. A change in health status, a health intervention, and an outcome measured with, me uh, with methods in a protocol. Now, I ask you, if I use 0.8 or 1.2 in an elderly population, and I'm going to measure the outcomes, can I really say that my outcome of 1.2 is better than 0.8? Yes, but I have to have correlations, I have to have statistical analysis, and this is another topic, how the scientific method has been produced. So, nutrition is important, we have no doubt, but we have challenges. Let me get to calorimetry. We all thought that surgical patients, and this is my area, I'm a surgeon, were hypercatabolic. Well, we did measure uh, resting energy expenditure before surgery, after surgery, th day three, day five. And you can see that no difference. These patients had exactly the same uh, requirements. But if they had indirect uh, markers of inflammation such as increased neutrophils, increased monocytes, and increased lymphocytes, then they had increased resting energy expenditure. So what do I want to say? It's not only because they are surgical patients that they are the same, although they were gastrointestinal postoperative surg uh, surgical patients, you have to consider their metabolic status. Let me move to a, an intensive care study by Pierre Singer and his group. Uh, the goal of this study was to assess if a controlled versus, a controlled by calorimetry deliver of nutrients versus a non-indirect calorimetry uh, provi provision of nutrition impacted the infectious rate and hospital mortality. This, is, this was a multicenter study. It was interrupted after six years because, as you can see the blue, Columns are the tight caloric control group versus the red ones. There were no statistical differences at the end, at, after six years. So once you have included patients for six years and you see no differences in your primary outcomes, why 
continue. But can I say that calorimetry is no good? Well, Pierre answers my question. First of all, this study was not enough powered. They calculated a sample size that was not reached, and using indirect calorimetry might give a signal towards improved survival. So, the common sentence at the end of every study, we need more studies. Now, let me move to protein. This just came out. This is a cohort. Okay, cohort studies have lots of problems, we all know, but they are real life. This was a cohort, uh, it's, the, um, it's the nurses' health study carried out by Harvard, and they started following these women. All of them were below 60, and they have been following them for a long, long time. Now, uh, they have shown that the amount of protein was associated with healthy aging. And the more, the better. And in this study, they associated plant protein as better results than, with, than dairy protein, but not a big odds. Another very brand new study carried out by the Swedish group, older adults with mild or moderate uh, renal failure. Uh, they were followed up, they measured total animal and plant protein, and they came to the conclusion that higher protein, higher total protein, and these are renal failures. And we hear your clinicians saying, renal failure patients cannot eat protein because that's bad. Well, this is not what they have shown. Higher protein was associated with lower mortality. And you can see here in these figures, the population younger than 75 or older than 75, then the more protein. And the black line is the renal failure patients. The orange line is the non-chronic kidney patients. The more protein, the better than those who ate less protein. So too much protein is not bad according to these cohorts. So my conclusions. Medical nutritional therapy is not a pill, first of all. It's offering various nutrients, food, first of all. And when we talk about medical nutritional therapy, we have to consider intraparental oral supplements. So the patient is unique. And in order for you to define energy requirements, protein requirements, you have to consider sexes. Do most studies separate sexes? No. Actually, intervention studies, not in nutrition, but overall, they are mostly done with men. I mean, we women are absolutely different. I mean, we go to the supermarket, we go shopping for fashion, but we are also different in another things. Except for Philip, he went shopping in Milano. Um, Stuart, Stuart. Yeah. Uh, we have two Philips, Stuart Phillips and Philip. So, anyway, it depends on ages, okay? You cannot put everyone in the same bag. It depends on nutritional status, body composition. And it also depends on diseases with different genetic backgrounds, comorbidities, and moments. So the treatment has to be individualized because my patient is not a guideline, okay? The proof of concept, do we really need evidence that nutritional therapy impacts outcomes? Well, if you go on a hunger strike, as these individuals in Ireland went many years ago for political reasons, you die. If you do not eat, you die, even you don't have a disease. So, to treat adequately, we need a nutritional diagnosis, then a plan, then you calculate the requirements, not only protein and calories, but the others. You define the nutritional route. You have to take into consideration tolerance. You have to consider quality and the safety of the treatment, and this is done by daily following up your patients, so clinical outcomes will depend on all this. Don't forget refeeding syndrome, don't forget side effects. So what do I do, Isabel? First, I nutritionally assess my patient. 
Number one, then I calculate the requirements based on current weight or ideal, if the patient is overweight or obese, 25 as a rule of thumb, 1.3 to 1.5 exception for patients, surgical patients with fish tula, burn patients to grams, start up with 50 to 60% and ramp up the feeding. And I early decide when to change routes based on the evolution of the patient, especially if my patient is malnourished. And then I metabolic and clinically follow up my patient because if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, this guy was smart, Hippocrates, not too little, not too much, we would find the safest way to health because everything in excess is opposed to nature. With that, I thank you very much for your attention.